Good morning, colleagues. I'll be chairing this morning session, and the session will start with Professor Gisbert Snyder, who will give a lecture on molecular design with machine intelligence. It's my distinct pleasure to introduce the speaker, who is a full professor of computer-aided drug design at Swiss Federal Institute of Technology, GH, in Zurich, and director of Singapore subsidiary of ETH. Uh, research focuses involve adaptive systems and integration of constructive AI in pharmaceutical and chemical biology. Uh, Professor Snyder's professional career started from pharmaceutical division of Roche in Switzerland, uh, from where he moved to academia in Italy, Goethe, Goethe University in Frankfurt, where he held Belstein and Dow Chair in Chem and Bioinformatics. He is a founding director of Rethink Think Tank of ETH, which is uh, figuring ways of integrating AI into, successful, into, into science, and he co-founded successful startup companies, numerous of them. He is a recipient of Herman Skolnick Award from ACS, uh, Prowse Institute Overton and Mayer Award for New Technologies in Drug Discovery from European Federation of Medicinal Chemistry, Menon Bernstein Award of German, German Chemical Society, and just recently to, to 2021, uh, he was awarded the <clears throat> Falling, Falling Wall Scientific Breakthrough Award of the Year. Without further ado, Professor Snyder, that's your floor. Thanks very much, Art, for the kind introduction and a warm welcome. Bonjour tout le monde. Um, it's a pleasure uh, to be here in Strasbourg once again. Uh, Professor Warneck, thank you very much for organizing this meeting, despite all the odds that may seem to play against us all uh, in the world on a geopolitical stage, but also in the academic community. I think it's it's wonderful that we can meet and that we do meet today to take a stand and uh, also take a stand for science uh, in the world. Science diplomacy may be one way uh, to support um, living together in peace. Thank you. Um, I will try to be the glue today between a wonderful evening lecture we heard yesterday on the theory of molecular similarity and promiscuity, act, target activity promiscuity, and the subsequent uh, lectures that will focus on reaction planning and very hands-on um, tools and, and algorithms uh, of the uh, chemoinformatics arsenal. So I will talk about applications from an ap application perspective. With my background in computer science and chemistry, uh, I'll take the stand of a chemist today and um, we have played around with various tools um, that help us, that guide us in the design of molecules. And I will talk to you, uh, talk with you about what, what works and what doesn't. I mean, Sasha, I had to do it. It's Voltaire. Um, we're in France. I had to do it. Doctors pour drugs of which they know little to cure diseases of which they know less into human beings of whom they know nothing. This statement bears a deep truth, namely the dilemma of limited knowledge. And that is a fundamental truth that we, we cannot escape. It is present today as it was during Voltaire's time, because we're facing a dilemma here. We're interacting when we design drugs, when we design bioactive molecules, we interact with a living being, the human body. And here we're working um, at the edge of chaos, as I'd like to call it. We're interfering with a chaotic system. And there are three main properties that make up a chaotic system. We work in the presence of error. Yesterday we learned a lot about errors in databases and how they can affect our analysis. We're facing non-linear uh, non relationships between chemical structure and biological activity, activity cliffs, for example. And finally, um, we have to concede our incomplete understanding of the human molecular pathology, which leads in the end to partial predictability. Partial predictability, that is a fundamental challenge we're facing and we cannot avoid, it, it cannot be um, ignored. And if we accept that, then I think we're in a good position to develop new algorithms that are 
applicable to a certain extent. We have to check for the applicability domain in which areas can we apply certain tools and in which areas shouldn't we apply certain tools. And we, learn, we will learn a lot about uh, these application domains throughout um, the forthcoming days. Now, what can we do? Let's turn the clock 30 years back. Artificial intelligence to the rescue. This is when I did my PhD. And that was the end of the previous AI wave. Let me cite. Artificial intelligence has nothing new to offer beyond the spectacle of an ancient, well-dropped errors replayed in a glitzy new medium. Hmm. Read it again. And um, we will come back to this statement uh, throughout the forthcoming days, I'm sure. But now we have a new wave of AI. What has changed, if any? We're now at a point where we have AI systems that are not directly programmed. They develop their own decision patterns. Aha. Uh -huh. So now we're slowly approaching true artificial intelligence. Hmm. First, let me briefly define intelligence. An intelligent system Needs to, needs to fulfill three um, prerequisites. It has to be able to solve a problem, a given problem, problem solving. Second, an intelligent system needs to be able to learn from experience. So it needs to be adaptive. And thirdly, it needs to be able to generalize, to cope with new problems uh, which, uh, with which this system is confronted. And this last point, that's the tricky part. Let's see how far uh, we've come so far in drug discovery. One corrective is the corrective of the experiment. Here you see a sketch of the, um, uh, the molecular design cycle. We start in the upper left um, with a human or now a computer that generates a new hypothesis. The hypothesis in this case meaning a new molecular structure. And this hypothesis is then synthesized either by the human chemist or more and more via robotic automated laboratories. And I will show you one example of these. And then the result uh, of uh, the biological test is fed back into uh, the machine, either our brain or an artificial brain to learn from data. So the interplay between hypothesis and test, hypothesis and testing, the hypothesis testing, deduction from theory to, in, to the instance, and then from the instance, in this case, the molecule, back to theory, revised theory, deduction, induction, that interplay is the corrective element of artificial uh, intelligence. So the system learns, and if the data set uh, we, that, that, that was tested so far is sufficiently diverse and representative of the problem, it may be able to generalize. Let's go through this design cycle in some more detail. We need three ingredients if we want to design new molecules from scratch or de novo. We need a structure generator, some device, some algorithm that sketches new molecular structures, assembles them atom by atom or fragment by fragment, or as we will see a bit later, uh, in a generative mode. Second, we need uh, selection and sco uh, scoring and selection functions. These can be explicit functions, for example, QSAR functions that analyze a, a computer-generated molecule, or they can be implicit, inbuilt into the system without the requirement for any external explicit, for example, I don't know, activity prediction. I will also show you how that works and how far we've come. And finally, we need some kind of navigation system and optimizer. And there are various ways to do that. Um, you may, uh, may have heard about active learning, um, stochastic, and of course, deterministic systems. And this is classic algorithmic um, optimization um, you all may be familiar with from your uh, education. So structure generator, scoring and selection, and an optimizer. The first um, ligand-based system that works in the absence of a computer, uh, sorry, um, of a target structure, um, was Topaz. We, we developed Topaz quite some time ago now, 20 years ago, and, but I'm showing you know, this, this, this slide um, and, and the history of this development for a certain reason, as you will see. The concept was, was quite appealing at the time. You take known drugs, Thierry, you know what I'm talking about, you take known drugs, cut them into pieces, 
in, in some kind of meaningful way, for example, by applying the recap tools. Matthias Rarai and team, have they have uh, extended these recap tools in a very nice way to dissect them in a chemically meaningful way and then take these fragments and reassemble them, shuffle them and reassemble them to make new drugs from old drugs. And this system is a workhorse. It works until today very successfully. On top of that, it delivers a pseudo forward synthetic uh, route for, uh, for synthesis, gives you an idea which connections should I form or, or break um, in order to obtain the new molecule, topaz. And the very first practical application um, is shown here. I'm starting from a single molecule, low data, and this is what I'm aiming for today. And I will talk about low data drug discovery. Low data, you take a single molecule with a known activity. In this case, um, it was a potassium channel blocker. And then <clears throat> the system designs, generates new chemical structures, new compounds, and the optimization works by comparing the compounds that the system assembles one after the other, depending on the optimization strategy, by comparing the newly generated molecular structures with a template in terms of their pharmacophore similarity. And Thierry Lange will, uh, at some later point today or tomorrow, Thierry, tomorrow, tomorrow talk about a fantastic pharmacophore similarity assessment tool, which can be used in these uh, kind of exercises. So design one was suggested by the compute, computer as on rank one, closest pharmacophore similarity, but significantly different chemical architecture. Just compare these two structures. Yes, there are certain substructure similarities, but basically a chemist would say, no, these belong to different chemical classes. And we dubbed these um, pairs of molecules that have different chemical structure. And as, as you will see, as you see, it was tested active. It is isofunctional. These molecules are isofunctional, have the same activity at this uh, potassium channel. We dubbed those scaffold top. This is a scaffold top. Hopping from one scaffold to the other by retaining the activity but changing chemical structure. Now, and then all kinds of optimization uh, techniques can be applied uh, to, to further optimize the molecule. First ever fully automated ligand based de novo design. Now, a natural extension of this idea of shredding molecules into bits and pieces by pseudo retrosynthesis um, is to apply pseudo forward synthesis and start from commercially available building blocks, fragments of molecules you can purchase or you have in your fridge, in your company. And uh, we collected uh, 25,000 of these um, commercially available building blocks and annotated each of these building blocks as to which literature known reaction it could um, be used for. Um, and we, we compiled 58 reactions by uh, making a, as a result of a huge survey, we asked hundreds of chemists worldwide, do you have a pet reaction? Which reaction do you like? And then we compiled this as a list and 58 reactions uh, turned out to be uh, prevalent across the globe. So we, we, we annotated each building block as to which reaction it could partake in. And then you could play virtual organic chemistry. So this is a virtual organic chemist, a medicinal chemist. Now we apply these virtual reaction schemes and um, obtain new molecular candidates, virtual products, plus a plausible synthetic route. So it's forward synthesis. We're, we're trying to approach here. And um, once you have these, these um, compounds in hand, you can apply all kinds of, 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 of scoring functions, machine learning functions, um, similarity, for example, again, pharmacophore similarity to a template and so on, or your intuition in the end, you say, okay, I like this compound. I don't know why, but let's synthesize it. Um, on average, after I would say, more than 100 such experiments, I would say 80% of these compounds that are generated by the system we dubbed DOGS, design of genuine structures by DOGS, uh, can be synthesized as suggested by the computer. Roughly 80% and roughly 50% have the uh, desired bioactivity, but this certainly depends on the scoring function applied. But synthesis is relatively straightforward with only approximately every fifth compound that doesn't work. 
Next step, next idea is to, on top of that, um, develop a, uh, a matrix, a matrix of probabilities that assigns a probability to each connection of two fragments. So you have one fragment and another fragment here in a one-step reaction for a one-step reaction. And using uh, suitable algorithms, at the time we used uh, molecular ant algorithms, have virtual agents crawl over this over the reaction space and find out which combination of molecules here just shown for one step reactions but of course you can extend that path to multi-step linear reactions they crawl over the, the building blocks assemble one here one there one there and form the virtual product the virtual product again is scored and then the path along which the ants crawled is either uh, increased in strength so that more ants follow along that path or decreased in strength, meaning probabilities are increased or decreased for depending on the success, predicted success of the virtual product. And this resulting um, probability matrix for each of the virtual reactions is very close to what, what today uh, we refer to as generative design. And if you couple this, such a probability-based de novo structure generator with a probabilistic, I will ex explain this uh, graph in a, in, in a second, with a probabilistic target prediction, activity prediction tool, you can play with probabilities. And that makes it very easy to uh, uh, computationally. So what, what do you see here? Um, you see four colored sketches. And um, in these are two-dimensional projections of um, activity landscapes. So all the virtual products sit somewhere in, in this rectangle here, 10 to the power of 30 molecules sit somewhere in, in this square, and the colors indicate the probability of being active for each of these virtual products. And we used, in this case, Gaussian process models, but you're absolutely free to use other, <laughs> other uh, prediction tools. Now, why did we use Gaussian process models? Because Gaussian process models compute probabilities. And you can, for example, play now with these uh, activity landscape. You say, I want to hit target one. This is a, a protein I, or an enzyme I wish to block, but I do not wish to inhibit this enzyme and that enzyme. And if you have probabilities, you can multiply them with each other and end up with a selectivity landscape. The desired activity has a positive sign and the undesired activities have a negative sign. You can multiply those with each other. So, and so this way you can combine desired on targets and undesired off target activities into a single selectivity landscape. You combine various machine learning tools together uh, and uh, use this joint predictor as a scoring function. Here is a practical example. Uh, the task was to find a molecule, to design a molecule automatically that is an antagonist of the dopamine receptor 5-HT2B, but does not hit all these others GPCRs and undesired targets. And this molecule Actually, a single step synthesis product, one synthesis step only, was designed, was generated by, by the tool I just uh, presented to you. And it is indeed a selective nanomolar antagonist. Down here you see the, uh, the uh, result of the binding assays we performed. Um, it is a selective antagonist of the desired target and does not hit all the other targets with one exception, dopamine receptor. So this is was the first example of true multi-dimensional multi-activity de novo design using a very simple tool, no AI involved at all, based on known building blocks, known reactions, and known machine learning tools. The tricky part is not the structure generation anymore. You can use almost any of these structure generators, wonderful tools by, by, by various groups. The tricky part is activity prediction, the scoring part. And um, we developed um, a tool, and that is our latest development in, in that field, we called TIGER, Target Inference Generator. It is based on ensemble similarity, and we heard something about nearest neighbor success yesterday when it comes to 
um, K nearest neighbor similarity searching when it comes to um, a target activity prediction. And this, this tool works in a similar fashion. I refer you to, to, to these two papers where the method is detailed um, to, in, in full. Just take it for granted that we have a nearest neighbor based statistics. So you, you sketch a molecule, for example, this in literature, it's called a selective COX-2 inhibitor, selicoxib, a painkiller. You sketch this molecule and now this molecule is compared to known drugs. We apply a certain statistical function to, to aid you in that. And as a result, the nearest neighbor activities to this compound are analyzed. And uh, after some statistical uh, number crunching, uh, fed back to the user. And in this case, 20 targets were predicted that uh, should be relevant for selicoxib in literature known as a selective COX-2 uh, inhibitor. And we tested all of these activities, all 20. 11 of those were correct. So roughly half of the predicted targets were actual targets of selicoxib. And look here at the binding constants, single digit micromolar. Look at the binding constant of uh, this drug that is marketed, they're in the same range. So this molecule is truly promiscuous. So this adds or sheds some light uh, on, on the discussion we had yesterday about the reliability of target annotations in databases. On average, um, our prediction tool says that each marketed drugs may have capability to bind to 11 targets. It doesn't this doesn't have to be necessarily true, but this is the outcome of the prediction system. And on average, we find that half of the predictions made by this tiger systems are correct. And now, of course, you can play. And we had a close look at natural products as an inspiration for drug discovery. More than half of current drugs on the market have their origin or were inspired uh, by natural products. For example, here, um, an ingredient of red wine Resveratrol, red wine, glass of wine each day is healthy. French paradox, I wanted to know why. Uh, and we, we applied a tiger target prediction. Uh, you see the predictions here and we found estrogen um, beta uh, antagonism. And this is known to be cardioprotective. Could be an explanation for the pharmacological effect of red wine, but also larger um, Cyclic macrocycles here, for example, cyclic structures can be analyzed uh, by, by this tool. And how is that done? Again, the same idea. If you draw this molecule and feed it to any of the uh, target prediction tools you find on the internet or our tiger prediction tool, it will fail. The trick is to again shred, to dissect larger molecules into drug sized chunks. So the system cuts the larger molecules into smaller pieces, makes predictions for the virtual fragments, and then looks for statistically significant predictions reported back to the user. This way, you, it, it is possible to use machine learning tools that are trained on small molecular data to a limited extent to expand the applicability domain to larger structures, for example, macro cycles, you cut down the macro cycles in smaller parts, make the predictions for the smaller parts, and then feed the, the, the sum of these predictions back to the user. Here we found the reason why this um, uh, Depsy peptide from the sea hair, here's an image of the sea hair, um, is actually has anti-cancer activity because it potently blocks prostanoid receptor EP3, and EP3 controls cell mobility. And if you block cell mobility of rapidly dividing cells, cancer cells, then you decrease uh, their, their um, survival rate. But now back to de novo design. Now we have a prediction tool that analyzes, is able to cope, is able to cope with natural products. We have a nifty uh, uh, fragment-based assembly routine, and uh, we can aim to uh, mimic complex natural products, which require, in this case, an 11-step total synthesis, and reduce this um, um, synthetic um, effort needed by designing smaller molecules that are easy to synthesize, scaffold hopping again. And here you see two examples. Design one um, was ranked 
on uh, number one by our dog's algorithm with our target prediction tool, Tiger, and 2D pharmacophore scoring again, uh, isofunctional, it looks very different and it can be uh, synthesized in uh, three steps. The second design that was, came as a surprise to me, here we used only um, shape only scoring. So we compared the shape of the virtual products with the shape of Englerine A, a three-dimensional conformation, just shape matching as similarity uh, function, as scoring function. And the most similar virtual product generated by our DOCS algorithm was design number two. So we synthesized it and is, it is equipotent. So there is a lot to learn from shape, back to shape. So the combination of ligand-based, say fingerprint-based, fragment-based similarity and shape similarity, it all amounts to pharmacophore similarity and Thierry will explain that to you in, in a bit. All right, a more recent example, just to convince you that this approach really works. Another, um, I take you through this uh, busy slide, another um, reference compound, again, single compound, low data, Merino pyrrole A, it's an anti-cancer compound. Um, it was predicted to be a COX-1 inhibitor. In fact, it is a COX-1 inhibitor, albeit uh, a rather weak one, but the de novo uh, generated molecule that was uh, found on rank number one, you see down here, it looks different. Uh, another scaffold top, it is extremely potent and it is the most important, most potent de novo design ever synthesized with nine nanomolar cellular selective COX-1 activity. So this is a true selective COX-1 inhibitor. We applied, uh, again, multi-target prediction. We said we want to see COX-1 activity and it worked very nicely. And it convert, now converts um, a seven-step total synthesis to a three-step total synthesis as predicted by the tool, following the, the reaction steps as predicted. And finally, our colleagues uh, in, in New Haven actually succeeded to um, co-crystallize here in Magenta, co-crystallize this de novo designed molecule in the binding site, in the active site of COX-1. And uh, the other two molecules you see down here in green and in orange, these are marketed um, COX um, inhibitors. And you see a flipped and inverted binding conformation of the de novo generated molecule and the um, known uh, X-ray structures, uh, complexes of marketed drugs. So this molecule would never have been found had we taken a structure-based molecular design approach. And in fact, we found out later only, this flipped binding mode of the de novo generated uh, molecule is identical to natural substrates of COX-1. They also bind in this upper half of the binding site. But that has nothing to do with AI. We just found that out a bit later and it was quite interesting. So taking you through the history of fragment-based de novo design and now back to AI. Now we have AI, recursive networks with long short-term memory. So this is one instance of the many uh, neural network approaches you can use for de novo structure generating, uh, generation. Um, we had a close look at chemical language models, which are based on long short-term memory systems, LSTMs. And these LSTMs were actually developed in 1996 by Jürgen Schmidhuber and colleagues already, but no one had used them at the time for de novo design. Only quite recently, they were rediscovered um, as, as an ancient tool in, in uh, machine learning for our field. The idea is the following, you take as much data as you have, in this case, small molecules. Uh, we took active molecules from Campbell, 650,000 bioactive molecules from Campbell, um, represent them as smiles, or, or you can use selfies. This works also quite well. Re represent them as smiles, insert a go token designating the start of this of the smiles, and then have these um, chemical language models learn the syntax of smiles. Smiles in, smiles out. That's the training phase. Re the task is to reproduce these strings e as exact as uh, exactly as possible. Once done, you can cut off the training part and come to the design part. Now you can have the system emit new smile sequences because, like with the ant algorithm I showed you before, 
there is an uh, internal probability matrix stored that, uh, that tells um, the, the, the system which token, which part of this small string to emit next to, to produce next as output, depending on the preceding tokens. And um, we actually, uh, the original approach works to start from the go token, and then the system produces one small uh, character after the other, reading left to right. I thought, why should we read left to right? And there are other languages uh, that read right for uh, from right to left, top down, whatnot. So uh, we developed a bidirectional uh, long short term memory system that um, can read and um, produce new small strings in both directions with a slight advantage, not really meaningful, but a slight advantage over um, the unidirectional approach. Right. That's all. That's a chemical language model. And I mean, smiles are um, a text representation of small molecules, but there were earlier approaches that used amino acid sequences as input to such a system. So um, we, 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 uh, that was actually my, my, my PhD thesis, and that's the reason why I'm showing you that. So uh, hands up, who is a PhD student? Excellent, super. So if you are lucky, if you're very lucky, your PhD thesis will survive a few years. Mine didn't, but I, I redis rediscovered it because at the time we already used um, um, probability matrix based de novo design tools. Today we call that generative learning, but we, knew, we use our, um, amino acid sequences. So you can design new amino acid sequences. And Art, you know what I'm talking about antimicrobial and anti cancer sequences. He's an expert uh, in this field. And um, here you see an NMR structure of such a de novo designed um, peptide. And see what happens if you. Um, put that peptide to a cancer cell. This cancer cell was filled with a fluorescent dye. You see, it dissolves. This peptide was designed to dissolve membranes, lipid membranes of cancer cells. It is a selective cancer cell killer, and the target is not a protein. That's the second reason I'm showing you this slide. The target is the lipid composition of the membrane. So it binds to lipid rafts and breaks the membrane. So for us in chemoinformatics, chemo not just proteins are useful targets, but also RNA structures, but also other biological objects like membranes, for example. You can use these tools to hop from known, for example, anti-COVID um, uh, medicines to new ones on the right. Chemists can pick for synthesis, and this works very nicely. Finally, uh, to wrap uh, up. Thank you for the reminder. I like to ramble on here. To wrap up, I, I promised you to talk about intrinsic scoring. So you can, instead of using an extrinsic, say for example, pharmacophore scoring tool or machine learning scoring tool, you can use the probabilities here for, of a chemical language model, CLM, 0 0.4, 0 0.2, and multiply these probabilities during the growth of a small string. And they, de they develop new small strings and use this joint probability as an intrinsic score of the usefulness or activity, potential biological activity of, uh, of the generated smiles. We synthesized top three. Here for one example, retinoid um, uh, ROR receptor. And all of them were active. Is this proof? Well, I don't know. A few more have to come. Of course, uh, you can couple these chemical language models now um, with uh, automated synthesis uh, machinery, like here a desktop laboratory, fully automated. We have a learning algorithm um, that generates new molecules using a chemical language model. These molecules are checked whether they are suitable for automated synthesis in this laptop sized uh, desktop synthesizer. We have 17 reactions implemented in there. Uh, and then they are being uh, analyzed for binding to, to a desired target. Results are fed back into the learning machine and we've closed the loop. And since I've babbled a, a bit too long today, I will um, relieve, release you now and I will stop my, my talk at this point, a bit premature, but that's fine. Thank you very much for listening. Uh, I hope you enjoyed the hist historic ride through the uh, de novo design. Um, machinery and uh, thanks very much for being here today. Thanks.
small room, I think. Um, you mentioned that you used um, some thousands of bioactive molecules to learn SMILES language. Why did you use bioactive molecules only? Isn't it like limiting the generative models to the existing scaffolds that we know? Very wise question. Um, I have no clear-cut answer to this, to this question. So the question was, um, why do we use known active molecules for training only? Well, we started from, from, from uh, with this approach because we wanted to have the system learn synthesizable molecules that are active in some way, have some kind of bioactivity. However, the novelty is limited. Uh, the novelty of the generated compounds is limited if you sample only the, the high scoring uh, molecule. So, you need to apply some kind of heuristic temperature scoring or some other heuristic to also pick out the, the new scaffolds uh, that are being produced. And in fact, uh, the latest version um, uh, of our chemical language model contains also artificial molecules that were generated by other systems, for example, a transformer or an um, autoencoder, and we feed th these also into the chemical language models. And this increases the diversity of the scaffolds generated on top ranking um, uh, well, positions. Yeah, hello, thanks for your presentation. Um, I have one short question. Um, you also tried to, you also trained your models to predict targets, right? So how many targets were there to predict in the, uh, in the last embedding, in the last layer? And also the, the, um, there's also a, a bit a huge imbalance inside of the different, all of the different classes, right? So do you think it's even useful to use sampling for something like this? Because sometimes, I mean, is this, is this even what you want in that case? So yeah, maybe you can have an answer to this. Love the question. So first part of the question, um, the, our current system contains 2,800 targets, roughly. And there are no, the trick here is uh, not to have uh, individual prediction models for each of these targets, but to use um, a certain similarity approach, an ensemble approach, to, uh, to, to actually infer which target could be relevant for a, a sketched molecule. Um, Check out the papers, it's described in detail. And in fact, um, the, the, the imbalance of the training data uh, needs to be uh, counterbalanced uh, by suitable statistical sampling. How do you control synthetic accessibility of your molecules, especially when you feed your LSTM with artificial molecules? We don't do that uh, for now during the construction phase, although we're working on that, but it's unpublished. For now, we do this uh, post hoc, after synthesis, virtual, uh, so after, after, after virtual uh, product generation. I have a last question. I'll just abuse my power of a chairman. Uh, and I have a very uh, simple first question. When the Tiger was first published? When was it? What year? 2017. Okay, because there is a story of Vyax, which is the second part of what you just said. You told about Celebrex. So Celebrex, for those who don't know, it was a blockbuster, still is, yes. in early 2000, being sold first year, like 2 billion US. That's the very reason they are then bought Monsanto, yes. for that exact drug. And then there was a Vyax from Mur, which yes. is a copycat, which pulled out of the market in 2004, because 38,000 people died. So how your VIAC system treats VIACs, how many targets would that get in Tiger? I have the answer for that, but I'm bound by confidentiality. <laughs> you can imagine why. I actually presented this, this Celecoxib example uh, to Pfizer okay. at the time. Huge crowd. After my talk, no one spoke. You say 38,000 people by using your software. See, point is, 
you, we, um, our, our community develops wonderful tools, but they're, although they may be useful to prevent um, undesired side effects, they're not always welcome because from a regular and legal perspective, someone could always come and say, you could have known, you could have known that a certain molecule has a certain side effect because it was predicted. So this raises the question, to which degree do we trust these predictions in the beginning? And of course, I mean, if the predictions are, are correct, uh, they can kill a project that has cost quite, quite some money already. So um, I'm the destroyer of projects with these tools, I can tell you that. Um, that extra slide will tell the story. Yeah, but I, I won't bring that slide, we can talk about it. <laughs> Thank you. We have some things to discuss over the wonderful wine. Thank you so much, Liz, for joining me. Thank you.